Okay, the last uh, video topic. <laughs> and there's a one discussion assignment. So um, this has been an intense little semester, I think. <laughs> Putting this 14 week course into 10 weeks really um, amplifies things. Um, but anyway, we're working our way to the end here. Um, I do, uh, as you're going through this um, uh, topic, um, at this point, um, I have already given the um, developing a final theme assignment. So if you haven't thought of your final theme yet, as you're looking um, at these, uh, at this video, in, be looking for ideas of something that maybe could be your theme. And if you have picked out a theme, then you can be, uh, you know, seeing if any of these artists might fit into your uh, final exhibition project. So uh, let's get started here. Um, this is Arda's message. Um, uh, this is one of my, um, I'm glad we're ending on this topic. It's one that I appreciate. I think uh, some of the artists are some of my favorites in here. Um, this is Mary Cassette, and this is from around the late 1800s. And, uh, you know, um, she was an Impressionist painter, but she was the only woman. And she was American, but... Um, it, uh, she wanted to go to school and they wouldn't let a woman uh, go to school for painting. Isn't that awful? <laughs> it just drives me nuts, you know, and that's in the late 1800s. So um, she went to Europe. Uh, she had a, a family who her, her parents were really, I mean, her family wasn't that happy. They would, you know, wish that uh, she wasn't doing this, but they did help her out a lot. And so they sent her to Europe and, um, she was able to uh, take painting lessons there and she became, um, she became well known and uh, actually sold some paintings. And so she uh, came back to the United States, you know, hoping, I guess, that things had changed, but they hadn't. And um, she was uh, just did not really, um, she had very little opportunity after that. Um, one of the things uh, you will see about her artwork, well, remember the Impressionism was where you would see the brush strokes and the bright colors and a lot of light. We've looked at those, um, like with Monet's Haystacks and some of the others. Well, um, I think because she was kind of relegated to, relegated to um, you know, what was considered women's uh, work, I guess, back then, her main subjects were uh, children and families and everyday moments. Um, so you'll see that a lot here. This is one of her more well-known paintings. It's a lot of it about um, you know, take, taking care of a home and children. The next artist is Umberto Baccioni. He um, was an Italian artist and um, right, uh, we talked about cubism. If you remember, we talked about uh, cubism in the beginning, right after cubism, there was a very short lived mo movement called futurism. And futurism was really uh, cubism, but they wanted to add movement to it. This was a time in the world where um, you know, people didn't always have to be on horse security. There was, you know, cars or trains, you know, planes. It was starting, it was at the beginning of um, that part of our history. And so people were really excited about being able to uh, move faster. So they wanted to add this um, element of movement into cubism. So you'll see here, if you look, uh, maybe you didn't notice at first, but there's a horse and a man riding on it. So they use the cubism and also try to capture a feeling of things moving. And this um, one is, to me what it looks like is a woman looking out a window because you see her face here and then here's the reflection. And then down here, it looks like the buildings on the street below. And then next to her looks like there's um, some kind of uh, tea setting or a dinner setting next to the window, but it does also looks like they're capturing some of that movement on the street scene. This artist is Merritt Oppenheim and um, 
She was a Swiss painter and sculptor. Uh, she kept um, a dream journal. Uh, her father was a psychoanalyst and um, she liked uh, kind of like the, you know, with the Dada and the surrealism. Um, she liked to play around with, with those things. Now there are some people, um, she was also another person that even though she was an artist, uh, she was not treated equally with the other men from that, from that group. And um, I don't, I've heard this, I don't have any proof of it, but that urinal that um, was the famous, um, paint, you know, sculpture that uh, was called the fountain, that it was actually her idea, but she knew that it was already like a revolutionary idea and that if a woman did it, it would never get. So she asked Marcel Duchamp to do it. I don't know if that's true or not, but it would, um, if it was true, it would definitely fit with the attitude of the times. Now her work, you know, we talked about surrealism was sometimes kind of nightmarish or dreams or visionary. Um, uh, this is uh, a teacup and spoon and saucer covered in fur. Now, this is like just the creepiest thing because if you've ever had a hair in your food, most of us like recoil of that. So can you imagine actually drinking or eating with fur lined utensils? This is a muff. Muffs were uh, something that people used to wear. Uh, women, I think mostly would put their hands in it to keep them warm. Um, so <laughs> gloves. Here, uh, more with the hair and the food. Here is um, like a beer stein, but uh, there's some kind of feral tail for a handle. And a bird, uh, bird legs on a table. Here's turkey dinner. Um, so this next artist, this is probably one of my favorite artists that we'll look at this semester. And we, there's a video, it is a little bit long, but I really encourage you um, to look at it because I think it's quite beautiful. Um, what uh, Doris uses her artwork for is to memorialize uh, people who have been, um, persecuted, I guess, you know, unfairly. And in this particular uh, picture right here, this is an installation that uh, she did. And when you look at this picture, these chairs, don't they look like they're just kind of all in there randomly? But when you look at it up close, um, the person that, uh, in the video, the person that worked on this talks about it. And he said that um, every chair had to be just placed exactly right. You can see how how enmeshed they are in there. And what it's about, this was in, um, I think it was Istanbul. And um, there was a kind of, a, oh, like a prejudice against, um, I think it was Jewish people and maybe Greek people. It was some, they, there, was, there was certain groups that were persecuted and they were just either hurt or just run out of town or just treated so poorly that they were forced to leave. So there were these the people who actually had businesses and homes and they just had to get up and leave, uh, just, you know, to save their lives and by the poor treatment of the other people. And so it would left, leave like these empty buildings. So this was a building that had been a business where people were pushed out. And so uh, you'll see, um, I do hope you watch that video. And in that video, Doris often, um, uses an empty chair as somebody missing, somebody that was killed or driven away. So all of those empty chairs symbolize the people who were um, forced out of this uh, area. This um, one that she did, now I, I, have, I teach this class in face-to-face -face classes and I've shown this slide to many classes and I've asked people if they can guess what this uh, looks like some almost like a tarp or, or something like that. And I say, do you know what this is made out of? And I've never had anybody guess it correctly. I would not be able to guess it myself if I didn't already know. Um, so before I move on to the next slide, I'm gonna ask you to just think about what do you think this is made out of? Like you can't tell me, but you can, you can talk to me through the screen. I just can't hear you. <laughs> so, here is what it's made out of. It's rose petals sewn together. 
Can you believe that? Can you believe how painstaking that must be to, let's just go back and look at it again. That's all sewn together rose petals. And the reason is uh, there was a nurse who came to Columbia, Doris is uh, from Columbia, and she, there was like a revolution going on and people were getting hurt. And um, this woman, I believe she was from the United States. Uh, anyway, she came to the country. She was a young nurse and she wanted to help people that had been hurt. And uh, she was there just out of the goodness of her heart. And she was not there for a very long time and she was uh, murdered. So when, uh, and there was uh, one of the things that Doris talks about is that during all of this political upheaval that there was so many people getting killed and so many horrible things happening that people couldn't actually take it all in. There was so much so that, you know, people were uh, like this woman, Nobody really knew her. She wasn't really uh, in Doris's eyes properly. Um, it, there was, had been no tribute to her life or any grieving. So Doris um, in her artwork work takes it upon herself to, to that's one of the things she does. Uh, and so this was made in this woman's honor. Uh, this is in your book and it's also in the video. Uh, and this is uh, back at that same turban hall that we've seen so many things in over this class in England. And uh, they had just acquired this new building with public money, had spent all this money to make the building um, proper uh, venue for the museum. And um, Doris's uh, piece that she wanted to put in here, they wanted to put a crack in the floor. And so of course, it was met with resistance because they had just <laughs> reclaimed this uh, industrial building and turned it into an art center at, at you know quite a cost and to uh, put a crack in the floor purposefully, uh, but but th for the sake of art, it happened. And um, what this piece is about is um, uh, when people, she'll talk about it better in the video, so I'll just talk about it briefly so I, she, she can explain it. Um, but when sometimes when people, uh, immigrants come into another country, they're tested and they were uh, asked to say a word that um, if you were, I think it was Spanish, if you were spoke Spanish, you could say this word with the right accent, but if not, you didn't have the right accent to say it and then they would kill you if you couldn't say it correctly. So is there a way of keeping people from coming in out of the country? So this crack is like the line that you step over and you know maybe risk your life uh, to try to enter this other country. Um, it's called, Shib I think, Shibboleth. And uh, uh, one thing that was kind of beautiful is once the whole exhibition was completed, they filled in the crack, but there's like always gonna be like kind of a scar there. Um, so that piece will always have a like a, at least a small presence even after um, the exhibition is over. So here you can see the crack in the floor. And here it is after it's been sealed up. This is Francis Ailes and he is a performance artist. And here are all these men actually moving a mountain. This is a video um, that you can watch. It's um, about sometimes doing something, make sometimes Sometimes to do something, you have to undo it or something like that. That's there's a name for the video, but un it's like creating is undoing also. So here he is um, pushing this block of ice through Mexico City until this is what it finally becomes. And he makes a video of it. So you can take a look at that if you want to. This is another one that actually I think is kind of funny. Um, he Francis Ailes was um, from Belgium and he moved to Mexico City and he came and didn't really bring much with him. So he had to set up housekeeping. He got an apartment. So he was going to thrift stores um, and secondhand stores to try and you know find things to set up a, a, a thrifty <laughs> house, housekeeping. And when, as he was doing it, he kept finding this painting. There was a Saint uh, Fabiola and the original painting uh, had been done, but was lost. So all of these people tried to make a copy of what they thought the painting looked like, but they were in all of these thrift shops. So he kept seeing them and they were all kind of the same, but kind of different. And he was uh, really interested in this. So he started buying them. Here's another one. 
And then he bought uh, all that he could find is in these thrift stores. And he did an exhibition of all of these paintings of the same saint. And you can see, um, remember our complementary colors make things pop out. So red and green are complementary colors. So it probably wasn't an accident that they painted this wall green to even make all these uh, red um, headpieces stand out even more. So I think, let's see, I think that there were, uh, he ended up getting 450 reproductions. And here's another piece that he did that's about, um, kind of like creating a tornado. This one, um, he, uh, uh, you know, when you look at, well, here, let's look here. Like, you know, when you look at uh, on a map, you'll see a line between countries, but there really is no line there. <laughs> it's just on the map. He decided this is the Middle East where, um, you know, people fight over, over, the, over um, land issues and, I guess they do everywhere, but uh, uh, anyway. Um, so here's even this color green. He decided to walk along that whole line and pay, actually paint the line that was there. And uh, he said that um, he didn't know what would happen to him. You can see he's coming up to these guards and these guards don't look like they probably might have patience <laughs> for somebody wanting to paint a boundary line. But anyway, he actually painted the real uh, line with that can of paint. That was another performance piece. This is Glenn Ligon, and uh, there's a video about him too. He, his message is dealing with um, social, uh, social awareness and black issues. And um, this is, there was a um, million, million man march, I think it's called. And there's photographs from that. This is, um, he took a uh, text and um, used like oil, used like a stencil and oil kind of paints, um, crayons, oil crayons, so that <clears throat> they became smeared, but he left it on purpose so that it was like, as if someone is speaking, but then it becomes more and more muddied. So there's a short video where he talks about uh, those. So um, you can hear it from him directly, <laughs> probably much clearer. This is Ai Weiwei, and he is considered to be one of the, um, you know, art historians um, and critics consider him to be one of the most important artists of our time. Um, and he is, uh, originally was from China. He really uh, ran into problems with the Chinese government. Uh, there's a video that, um, it's a documentary kind of film um, called Never Sorry about him. I've shown it to some of my face-to-face -face classes, and I recommend it if you're at all interested in him. Um, it's an interesting video about uh, the struggles that he had with uh, free speech in, in China. This is a piece that is, these are all... Uh, all that behind them, they're little handmade pistachio nuts made out of ceramics, but they look like pistachio shells. And it's a piece that's making a statement about um, mass production of items in China. Um, before he got in trouble with the government, they actually commissioned him to do this bird's nest that was for, it was an arena for the Olympics. Here's a piece um, he took uh, this is one of his earlier pieces. You can see he's younger, and he took um, these are valuable ancient antiques and smashed them. He also had some where he painted them, and he was protesting in China. They were uh, take there was historic buildings and neighborhoods, uh, beautiful buildings that they were tearing down their history to build like kind of modern kind of not well-made buildings, and he was uh, pro protesting this. Here's some, uh, these are uh, valuable urns that were painted with really, you know, like probably the kind of paint if you went in, you know, if you go into Lowe's or, Home, or any paint store and they have like the oops paint where they made a mistake, 
in making, mixing the paint. Well, these are inexpensive, not very nice paints, painting over these things. And so that's what he's saying, that they're taking these ancient artifacts that are buildings and destroying the beauty and putting up something shoddy. This is um, when things really began to clash. This was uh, elementary school. And uh, this is after an earthquake. Now you can see the other buildings pretty much made it through, but um, this, uh, uh, th all these, there was many children killed in this um, uh, collapse of this elementary school, but the government did not, it was a government built building and it was one of these kind of shoddy buildings that he was uh, protesting, actually. And so it was um, not built very well. They called them even tofu buildings because they were uh, built so cheaply that they would not withstand. Um, they had no precautions for anything like this. And so a large group of children were killed, but um, the government didn't want people to know how many. So I way, way and uh, a group of volunteers, they did the investigative work to find out how many children were actually killed. And you can see it was quite a few here. And um, so this is, the government was not happy with them for doing this. Um, this is a piece that he did, I think it was in Germany. He couldn't have done it in China. And uh, each one of those little squares uh, is a backpack, a child's backpack. And this Chinese lettering uh, spells out something that one of the mothers said about her daughter. She said, um, I think, let's see if I have it. Uh, it was something like, for seven, for seven years, she had a very happy life. I think that was the quote. So he made this quote into like an art piece um, made out of children's backpacks. So each one of those backpacks is represents one of the children killed in that school collapse. So uh, this is his opinion of uh, uh, what the government's doing. And I guess he wasn't happy with us either. Um, and then, so the Chinese government uh, they they retaliated. They, he had two studios. They just went and, and totally smashed one of his studios, just destroyed it. And then um, they said that he owed, I think like 2 million in back taxes, which he did not. So they arrested him for not paying these taxes <laughs> that they made up. And um, there's he has a whole, uh, uh, he did a whole art piece about, uh, he was treated really poorly in during this time. When he did get out of jail and people around the world raised the money, the $2 million and gave it to the Chinese government and got him out. And um, he still kind of fought with them, but he eventually um, moved, I think, um, I, last, I think I heard he was living in Germany, I think. But he's still producing artwork. Um, just a few years ago, I, he had a big exhibition in Grand Rapids at the Meyer Gardens and I saw some of his work. Oh, this is another uh, time when the police beat him up and caused uh, actually pretty severe damage on his brain, on his head. So um, he did another movie too, and I actually haven't seen it. I want to see it. It's about, uh, he did another piece about immigration. So this brings us to uh, Alexander Rodchenko, and he was a Russian artist, a painter, and then in the Russian Revolution, he started doing um, these propaganda type posters and uh, actually just devoted himself to doing that and became well known for uh, doing these well-designed posters. So remember, this is all about message. So this is a political message. Here is a message in advertising. This was the Nike campaign when they came up with the slogan, just do it. So it was a group called Wyden and Kennedy who did this campaign.
So that's kind of scary. <laughs> That's kind of scary too. But it's a message, right? Okay, here's our last artist. This is Jenny Holzer. And um, she is a conceptual artist uh, who, do, who would do uh, what you call installations. And she would have these sayings that she called truisms. They were like little bits of um, kind of like little adages. And so like, for example, this one, protect me from what I want. But then it's publicly put up like on a billboard. Here you can see, and you can see this is a while ago. Look at the cars. Um, slipping into madness is good for the sake of comparison. Everyone's work is equally important. Here, uh, broadcast onto the uh, side of a building, your oldest fears are the worst ones. Don't allow the lucid moment to dissolve. Looks like it's shot up into the sky. Um, those of which earlier work later on, she started putting, uh, she started writing messages. Um, I actually find them a little harder to read, but they were in neon installations. Like symbols are t-shirt abuse of power comes as no surprise. Here's a list of some of her truisms. And we're going to take a look. There's one, we have one last, um, Let's see if I can get here into the, where is, oh, I don't know, um, let's see, I gotta find, do I have to go all the way back here? How did, uh, here we go, there we go. All right, so let's take a look here at our, so here is a video, here's a list of names. The Dor Salcedo video, the Ai Weiwei, uh, there's a video about Ai Weiwei, watch that one, the Gladden Ligon one. And here's one of uh, Francis Ailes, the one with the ice <laughs> melting in Mexico City. So, and I just slipped up there, okay. So I'm gonna pull up, here we go, the last, the discussion. So this is due August 6th, and I believe August 8th is our last day of class. So. Um, this one should not probably take you that long to do. Um, so I would say probably try to get it done sooner than that if you can, but you have till the end of the class. So Jenny Holzer, who I just talked about, publicly displays text statements in various ways to create a reaction. In her earlier work, she created provocative statements that she called truisms. She shared them by using light up billboards usually reserved for advertisement. Now, um, here is a video about her. Here is a list of some of her truisms if you want more uh, inspiration. Uh, so re for your homework, responding to Jenny Holzer's truisms, compose your own truism. Something you've never heard articulated before, but is a nugget of wisdom that you have learned to live by in your experience. Find a way to share it with the world. Make a sign, have it engraved on a gift, get a tattoo, run a skywriting plan, et cetera. Photograph how you shared your truism with the world and submit the picture in this assignment. So think what your truism is and then think of a way to share it with the world and then take a picture and add it to the discussion. And that is your last assignment. So um, uh, contact me if you have any questions. Uh, there won't be any more videos. Uh, I may send out some announcements and um, you have the, all the work has to be in by the last day of our class, which is Thursday. Let me just look here. Let me, I, can, I can look at the calendar here. I think it's on a Thursday. I believe it's the last day. You I know, mean, I thought it would be a Friday, but let's see. Yeah, so let's... Let's look at this one down. Okay, so this is this is the calendar for August right here. So that Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. There's so the eight. That is our last day. So everything is due. That'll be the last day to turn anything in in uh, all the homework. So the midterm has to be turned in by then because I will have to grade everything and turn in your final grades. So um, contact me if you have any questions and um, 
I hope, I hope, uh, I know this chorus has been a little intense because of the time, but um, time, you know, doing it in a shorter amount of time, but um, I can tell some of you have along the way have um, enjoyed some of the assignments. So uh, if you like art, I hope you enjoyed it. And if um, this was new to you, I hope that it was a good experience. So I hope the rest of your summer is good.